let us jump in to the Torah study. Ladies and gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Daily Power Parsha, our daily look at the Torah portion. So let's reset this week's Torah portion. Torah portion is Miketz, and it begins with Pharaoh's dreams. Pharaoh has two dreams. He cannot, for the life of him, figure out what they mean. He calls his best and brightest and advisors, and no one gives him a satisfactory um, perspective on what the dreams mean. He hears about Joseph. He pulls him up from the dungeon, dresses him up, and Joseph interprets the dreams of Pharaoh seven as meaning seven years of famine, seven years of plenty, followed by seven years of famine. And the message of the dreams, Pharaoh, we call him Big P, right? Pharaoh, the, the message... Of, the message is you got to save during the years of plenty so that you'll have for later. And Pharaoh is so enthralled. He loves this. He puts Joseph in charge. He calls him Tzapnat Panech. I love that name. And the revealer of hidden things. He puts him in charge of the entire economic structure. No one is allowed to move their hand or foot without Joseph's permission. Second only to the king himself, Joseph um, aggressively store, saves, stores and saves and preserves the grain. When people try to preserve their own grain, it spoils. Comes the year of the years of famine. No one has food, including the Egyptians. All of their, all of their um, storehouses, privately owned, are all rotted. There's nothing left. The only one that has food is Joseph, the government Joseph's run food. And as we ended off yesterday's, love this part of the story, as we ended off yesterday's reading, middle of reading number four, the end of Genesis chapter 30, sorry, 41, the famine had spread to the entire region. It wasn't just localized in Egypt, the entire region was hit. Well, that is the best segue possible to Genesis Chapter 42, where we read about Jacob's endeavors to get some food. I'm going to share my screen. Let's jump in. Genesis chapter 42. This is, just so you can see from the page, Miketz, reading four, middle of the reading, right here. So Jacob, Yaakov, who's the father of Joseph and of 11 other sons. Jacob saw that there was grain being sold in Egypt. How did he hear this? He turned on the news. Right, breaking news, grain being sold in Egypt, done. So Jacob said to his sons, why do you appear satiated? In other words, um, okay. The, in the Hebrew, tisra'u, it could mean also, why are you afraid? Why are you anxious? You know, let's just go, go down to Egypt and get some food. But here he translates it, here the translation is, why do you appear satiated? Which hearkens, which evokes, Rashi's, Rashi's um, commentary. So let's jump into this, Rashi. Give me a second. Okay, so Jacob saw that there was grain being sold in Egypt. So Rashi asked the question, from where did he see it? He says, he saw that there was grain being sold. He saw, he heard. How did he see it? Again, it, there weren't TV broadcasts, you know, Twitter, Twitter uh, videos. Like, what's, what's he seeing? Is it, not, it, it, is it not true that he did not see it, only that he heard of it? As it says, behold, I've heard, etc. in verse number two. What then is the meaning of saw, Rashi asks? Why does it say that he saw that there was food? So Rashi answers, he saw with a divine mirror that he still had hope, Shever in Egypt, but it was not a real prophecy to explicitly inform him that this was Joseph. In other words, he saw through some sort of aspaklaria. I love that word in, in the Hebrew set, aspaklaria. Aspaklaria even sounds like something that sparkles, right? Aspaklaria, doesn't that sound sparkly? Come on, right? Are you with me? Yes, aspaklaria, it means like a looking glass, like um, kind of a mirror, but when you look into it, you don't see a reflection. You see like a vision or you see to the other side or you see something else. So this was like a crystal ball type thing. This was his aspaklaria. And I'm, I'm not saying he actually had a physical item, but he saw in some sort of divine prophetic way that there was some sort of something for him in Egypt. 
food, perhaps? His son, his long lost son for 20 years, perhaps? Yeah, that too. Is that, a, is that used in modern Hebrew, that word? I don't know. I don't know. I don't believe so. Aspaklaria hameira. It's like, uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's a phrase that's used in ancient Hebrew. It's a really beautiful phrase. I love it. Aspaklaria. Aspaklaria. Let's continue. Why do you appear satiated? He tells his sons. What does that mean? Why do you show yourselves before the sons of Ishmael and the sons of Esau if you are satiated? In other words, why are you walking around like the hunger is not affecting you, like the drought, like the famine is not affecting you? What does that mean? So Rashi continues to explain. For at that time, they still had grain. According to the Talmud, Jacob's family had stored their own grain back in Israel, back in Canaan. They had their own grain. So when the rest of the world was in a famine, they were actually okay. Why did they store the grain? Did, did they have a prophecy too? So I, I'm not sure. It, it, where the, the piece of that is missing as far as the origin story of why they did so. But apparently they had enough to survive. But Jacob ever worried about the optics. Remember, he's worried about the previous stories. Worried about the optics of what, what are the neighbors going to think. He's concerned that if the Jewish family, if his family has food and no one else has food, it's not going to look good and there's, it's going to evoke jealousy and it's just not, not good to stir the pot. So he, tell, he essentially is telling his kids, go down and buy food like everyone else, even though they had their own food. Are you with me on this? They had their own food. They had their own food. Okay, I'm going to toggle Rashi off because we got what we needed. And um, let's continue with verse number two. So Jacob said to his sons, verse two, behold, I have heard that a uh, heard, you see, not, not saw. So he saw that there was grain, but he tells his kids, I heard. He saw through a vision, a prophetic vision, something in, in Egypt. But he tells his kids, I've heard that there is grain being sold in Egypt. Go down there and buy us some from there so that we will live and not die. What does that mean, live and not die? Either live and not die because of the famine, but they were okay. Live and not die out of anti-Semitism. You with me? Or, or, or some Jew hate. So not to stick out. We don't want to stick out and have us be the envy of everyone else, of our neighbors, of our family, of our mishpacha. We don't want to be, we don't want to evoke the ire, not the pirate, our, the, the ire of, um, don't want to evoke the ire of the wrath of, uh, of the locals, the neighbors, the family. So you go down and buy food like everyone else. Let's continue. So Joseph's 10 brothers went down to buy grain from Egypt. There you go. Why 10 brothers? There were 12. Well, Joseph is already in Egypt. He's number 11. And number 12 is Benjamin. What, what happened with Benjamin? Verse 4. But Joseph's brother, and that means his brother from his mother, right? His, the other, Rachel's other son, Benjamin. But Joseph's brother, Benjamin, so Jacob did not send him with his brothers. Because he said, lest misfortune befall him. I don't want to lose another son, my last remaining son from my beloved wife, Rachel. Remember, he wanted to marry Rachel from the beginning. And he got, uh, you know, bamboozled into marrying Leah. And then he had kids from four, two wives and two maidservants, four, women, four mothers. Anyway, cut the story short, cut the long story short. He only had two sons from Rachel, Joseph and Benjamin. Joseph was gone. You know, well, Joseph is in Egypt, but he didn't know that. And Benjamin, he didn't want to risk. So he said, Benjamin's not going down. 10 of you go down. So what's interesting is these are the same 10 that kidnapped and sold Joseph. These are the same 10 brothers that were there for the sale, that were participating in the sale of Joseph as a slave. So the sons of Israel, ah, B'nai Yisrael, you might have heard that term, B'nai Yisrael, children of Israel, sons of Israel, literally, not referring to the Jewish people, but literally his sons, came to purchase, they came to purchase among those who came. For the famine was in the land of Canaan. The famine was everywhere, including Canaan slash Israel. And so they came to purchase, they came to purchase food. Now, what's going on over here is something interesting. As the commentaries point out, and that is they came to purchase among those who came. 
among those who came. That's a that's a trigger to open up to, to open up an interesting insight. It says in the Hebrew, "Betoch habayim." They came amongst the other ones. So imagine. I always picture this as um, I don't know why, but for some reason I picture it like like a line for customs or a toll booth where you have like different lines, right, in different stations. And people trying to get in and purchase some food. And there were different lines. And so the brothers didn't all pile up 10 in one line. They went out amongst the different lines. They went out amongst the, the, different, the different places. They tried to, they tried to um, smuggle themselves in, so to speak, amongst the rest of the, of, of the people that were coming, clamoring, to purchase food from Egypt. That was the only place to buy food. By the way, what's, what's crazy is that you and I know in recent times what it's like to, I mean, who would have thought, right? But what it's like to buy food or try to buy stuff in, in when, when things are scarce. Remember toilet paper at the beginning of the pandemic, right? There's a run, there's runs on gasoline sometimes, right? You try to get gas. It's like, you got to wait in line and all this stuff. So you know, we unfortunately, I mean, even though we live in a time of more prosperity than ever in human history, and that's not even a question, um, but we've we've had moments, you know, in, in our lifetimes, in recent past, where we've had, you know, um, um, apprehension and, and, and anxiety over is stuff going to be available. Supply chain shortage, you know, all this stuff. So anyway. So that's that. This is what's going on. So people are now clamoring to Egypt. That's the only place that has food. And the brothers decided if they all go in one line, it's just not. It's going to raise too many questions. Like ten Jewish guys, so we'll split up. We'll we'll kind of like try to not stand out so much. That was her thought. Well, let's see what happens next. Turns out that backfired on them. Now, verse number six. Now Joseph, as we know, was the ruler over the land. Ruler over the land means, of course, he wasn't the king, he wasn't Pharaoh, but he was the guy who was managing all this stuff. It was he who sold grain to the entire populace of the land. In other words, he was the guy that was in charge. And Joseph's brothers came and prostrated themselves. They bowed down to him with their faces to the ground. So now you have a very interesting thing. Remember, they're in different, according to the commentaries, as I've been mentioning, they were in different lines, but at some point, they're standing before you had to speak to Joseph to get food. He was the guy that was going to determine, you know, what you got, how much you got, maybe the price. I don't know if that was a floating scale, but he he was the he was you spoke to, to Joseph ultimately. So now you have Joseph's brothers. And at some point they they arrive in front of him and they all bow down to him because he was the guy. That's what you did when you came to a ruler, when you came to a leader, a guy, a minister, you bow down. Okay. So Joseph saw his brothers. Verse seven. This is one. Rabbi, of the, yes. Rabbi, I have two questions. Like you just said, bow down to Joseph. But I mean, as a Jewish person, we shouldn't have people bowing down to us, right? Right. Right. That's one but, thing. One, one question. And the other question is, how did the brothers physically, distinctively, how did others know, you know, without knowing who they were, know that they were Jewish from their... I would I would imagine that the way of dress was different. In other words, their clothing was different, their whole mannerism, you know, the way of the way of being. I, I would imagine that jo Jacob's family, and I can't tell you specifics, but I, my my understanding is the way, you know, is that there was there was a distinctiveness. They 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 were identifiable. I mean, even Joseph, they called him a Hebrew, the, a Hebrew lad, a Hebrew slave. Like they could tell there, there was a there was a sense of of, of someone being a foreigner. Now here you had a lot of foreigners that were coming to buy, to buy food, um, but it seems like they were, they were gonna stand out. They didn't want, they didn't want to raise any, any uh, un, undue attention to themselves. So what about, yeah, the bowing down? The bowing down, I don't know. I don't have a good answer. You're right, we should not bow down to human beings. They, right. what, we find that Jacob himself bowed down to his brother Esau. We find here that they're bowing down to him. I don't know. Maybe it was different when there was a king. Maybe you could bow down to a king, just in the sense that a king is not uh, necessarily his own thing, but maybe representative of you know some divine authority. Not that he's God, but that he represents 
God's blessing of, you know, authority and monarchy on earth, maybe something like that. But it's a good question. Can you bat, like in Jewish law, do you bat down to a Jewish king? If we had a king, a Jewish king, right? If we had a temple and a king, we would all know the answer. But it's been a while. It's been a minute. So I'll have to, I'll have to look that up and get back to you. Um, <laughs> but it's a good question. But anyway, they, they bow down. And what's and verse seven is one of those verses that just you, you gotta love. Joseph saw his brothers and he recognized them, but he made his he made himself a stranger to them. In other words, he didn't speak to them in familiar terms. Say, "Hey guys, it's me." He didn't do that. Not yet, at least. He made himself a stranger to them. He pretended like he didn't know them, and he spoke to them harshly. He spoke to them harshly. That's the other piece of it. And he said to them accusatorily, where do you come from? And they said from the land of Canaan to purchase food. They answered another question. Why are you here? Where did you come from? And why are you here? We came from the land of Canaan. And why are we here? To purchase food. Now the Torah doubles down on this. Now Joseph recognized his brothers, but they did not recognize him. Why not? Simple level, because he was much older now. Than, what, than, than he was at 17. They Last time they saw him, he was 17. And you know what he looked like at 17, right? He was the guy with the hair and with the eyelashes, right? He was making up his hair and his eyes. Remember that? He was uh, beautifying himself. That's what he was doing at 17. Now he's 30. And he is, I'm sorry, he's not 30. He's not 30. He's 37. He was 30 when he stood before Pharaoh, and that was at the beginning of the seven years of, fam of, of plenty. And now it's at the end, after seven years of plenty, starting in the years of famine. So it's seven years later. He's now 37. It's 20 years later, 20 years after he left home, uh, was sold as a slave. So at 17 to 37, you look different. All of his other, the other 10 brothers were older than him. So he recognized them. They didn't change as much. I mean, I don't know, from what, 25, 30 to 50? Okay, whatever. I mean, they, they, he could still recognize. According to the com some commentaries, it was because of his beard. At 17, he didn't have a beard. But at 37, he had a beard. You know, in ancient Egypt, you had to have a beard, right? King Tut. Didn't King Tut have a beard? I think they had beards, right? Whatever, either way. Joseph, according to, the, according to our commentaries, had a beard at 37 that he did not have at 17. They didn't recognize him. Kabbalah says something deeper, that Joseph recognized his brothers. He knew who they were, but they didn't know him. They, they, couldn't, they couldn't figure this guy out. Now, they literally didn't know who he was in this moment. They didn't know that the guy standing in front of them, selling all the food and running Egypt, essentially, was their own brother that they sold as a slave 20 years prior. They had no, they, there was no way that they could have fathomed that as a possibility, as a possible outcome in that, in that story. And, and it was. It was. So they didn't recognize him. But again, spiritually it means they couldn't recognize who he was. The power that he had to overcome adversity and to triumph in that way. The power that he had to be an influencer in a society that could otherwise sink a person spiritually. They, they, couldn't, they, they couldn't fathom that. All right, back inside. So Joseph, verse nine, Joseph and Joseph remember the dreams that he had dreamed about them. You remember the dreams. In the dreams, they bowed down to him. They had all stocks of uh, bundles of grain and they bowed down to him. When they're showing up in Egypt, he's the viceroy and they're bowing down to him. You don't think he's going to think about the dreams? That was the last conversation. I don't know if the last conversation, but not long before he was uh, kidnapped and sold. That's what he was talking about. He had these dreams and now they're bowing down to him. But you know, he also had other dreams. He had another dream, but the sun, moon, and stars. And that means that not only would his brothers bow down to him, first of all, 11 stars bowing down to him. So Benjamin and his father and his mother well, Benjamin's not there. His father's not there. His mother passed away. So he remembers that the dreams, although they're being fulfilled slowly, it's not yet time. It's not yet time. So he said to them the following. 
He said to his brothers, accusatorily, harshly, he said, you are spies. And you have come to see the nakedness of the land. Nakedness here is a euphemism for the weak point of the land. You've come to find our vulnerability. You've come to find Egypt's vulnerability. You guys are lying. You're not here for the food. You're here on a reconnaissance mission. You're here on a spy mission. You're here to find out our weaknesses and our vulnerabilities, and you're going to exploit them. They're being accused of espionage. And they said to him, his 10 brothers, no, my master, your servants have come to buy food. It's not true, they say. Well, it's not true. You hear about this all the time, right? Tragically, unfortunately, tragically, where people like are visiting you know, some other country and they get, they get pulled in as spies and get, get arrested and whatever. And who am I? I mean, I don't know what's, what's this and what's that. But in many cases, it seems like, you know, these are completely made up charges, at least the way it's presented sometimes in the news. And the point here is he, he's accusing them of being spies and they're saying, not true. We're here for food. Verse 11, they feel like at this point, if they give a little bit more background, Maybe it'll explain things. So they start launching into a bit of. Rabbi, excuse yeah. me, but isn't? But Joseph is just saying he doesn't really feel that, right? He doesn't really think that. Yeah, of course not. He's he's yeah. messing around with them. Now, yeah. why is he messing around with them? Okay, so one could say payback. They right. they put they put him through the ringer. He's going to put them through the ringer. But I we'd rather not not think of Joseph in such you know, retalat retaliatory terms or such like revenge terms. Let's think of Joseph in a bit of a bit of a higher level. Joseph was, first of all, the dreams. He had to facilitate things where they would all come down and bow down to him without knowing who he was. That's one thing. The other thing is he wanted ultimately to put them in a position where they would be faced with the choice to sell out their brother, Benjamin, or to rescue him. And by them rescuing him, that would kind of complete the circuit and do tshuva for them selling him out and not rescuing him in his time of vulnerability. So, and, and that's his brother from his, from his mother, from Rachel. Either way, he, he, what we know for sure is that he is falsely, and he knows it's false, falsely accusing them of being spies. He doesn't believe this. Of course not. He knows who they are. He knows exactly why they're here to buy food, but he's speaking with them harshly. He's, you know, so he said, so, so they say to him, no, not true. We came here to buy food. And again, they're giving a little bit more background information of who they are. We are all sons of one man. We're brothers. We are honest. Your servants were never spies. We're not spies. We were never spies. We're not working for anybody. We're, we're just here to buy food. Why, why are we so many? Because our father had a bunch of kids. That's it. We're just, we're just sons of one guy, sons of one father. Just here buying food, nothing to see. But he said to them, no, verse 12. But you have come to see the nakedness of the land. You're lying, he says. You're here to, to search out the vulnerabilities of Egypt. And you're working for someone or something or some government. Then you're going to come and attack. And they said, it's not true. We, your servants, are 12 brothers, 12 brothers, there's 10 of them, 12, they feel like they need to give more background information. We're actually 12. You're talking to 10, but there's 12. How do you get 12? The sons of one man in the land of Canaan. We're not working for any agencies, governments, any rogue officials. This is straight up 12 sons of one man in, one man in, in Canaan. But there's only 10 of them. So they explain, and behold, the youngest is with our father today. We didn't bring the baby. I mean, he's not a baby anymore. We didn't bring the Benjamin. He's with dad, and one is gone. One is gone. That's Joseph. We started off as 12, okay? One is still home, and the other one, we don't know where he is. So that leaves 10 of us, and you're speaking with 10 of us. The other one, he's just not here. That's Joseph. But the irony is that he was there. Yeah? They said the last, the 12th son is not, it was 11th, but he's not here. 
you're literally talking to him, but they didn't know. Let's continue. And Joseph said to them, this is just what I have spoken to you, saying you are spies. In other words, you're now confirming my suspicion by telling me 12 sons and da 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 and the one is not here and one is gone. You're confirming, you're, you're confirming this idea. Take a look at Rashi. Rashi explains the thing that I have spoken, namely that you are spies, is true and correct. Everything, all the details that you're telling me, just add fuel to the fire of my suspicion and my belief that you are spies. Ten, son, ten, ten, ten sons of one man, sure. Twelve, and one is not here, and the second one's not here also. You're spies. So Rashi, this is the simple explanation. The Madrasha explanation is, however, the following. He said to them, the Madrash adds some dialogue, which is fascinating. So Joseph said to them, so you told me you're 12, one is home and the other one's gone. And if you find Joseph, the one that's gone, and they, his owners, because you sold him as a slave, his owners demand a large ransom from you. Will you ransom him? He's asked him theoretically. You said you have 12. 12, 12 brothers, 10 are here, one is home, and the other one's gone. If you found him, would you ransom him? Would you pay the ransom? Yes, they replied. He said to them, and if they say that they will not return him for any money, let's say they say, we're not, no, no not taking any money. We're keeping, keeping Joseph. What would you do? They said, for this, we have come to kill or be killed. They said to Joseph, not knowing he was Joseph, if we would find our brother Joseph and the captives would say, you're not getting him back, even with all the money in the world, we would go to war. We would kill or be killed to rescue him. So he said to them, that's exactly what I said to you. You've come to slay the people of the city. Told you. Told you you guys have ill intentions. You're here not to harm the city. You just said that if Joseph... You know, Joseph ended up in Egypt. If Joseph is here, you find him. You're going to go killing on a killing spree to get him back. Oh, so you are exactly this. I told you you're, you're a bunch of misfits and, 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 and bad characters. Okay. I divine with my cup, he says. That too, you know, he had a goblet that he pretended to divine with. I divine with my cup that two of you destroyed the large city of Shechem. He knew that because he was there. <laughs> that was his brother's. But he, no one else knew that. It's not like the internet where everything is forever, like diamonds. But it's like, right? So he knew what that, Le that Shimon and Levi had destroyed Shechem. So he pulls now. He says, I see in my cup. I'm holding that teacup. I see a coffee cup. I see in my cup that you too, you too destroyed Shechem. And they're like, whoa, how does he know this? He's accusing them of being spies, bloodthirsty, criminals, murderers, etc. Okay, they're in a pickle here. They just came for some food. They're getting a lecture. Um, right, so continue back inside. The Torah says 15. With this, you shall be tested. By Pharaoh's life. He's swearing by Pharaoh's life. Sure. You shall not leave this place unless your youngest brother comes here. He says, you want me to believe you? You want me to believe that you're not spies? Okay. Then bring Benjamin here. Send one of you and let him fetch your brother. In other words, one of you should go to get Benjamin. I'll keep the other nine here. And you will be in prison so that your words will be tested whether truth is with you. And if not as Pharaoh lives, you are spies. You're concocting the story. You have 12 sons, 12 brothers, one father, Canaan, but one is not here. One is at home. Yeah, you have one at home. Bring him. Bring him. Let's see. Let's see if you're if telling the truth or if you're lying. Okay. So the rest of you will stay here. One should go and come back with Benjamin. So you put them in prison for three days. On the third day, Joseph said to them, do this and live. I fear God. He says, if, do, if you do this, you'll be okay. And then he says, I fear God also. There's no, um, no rush in this. Okay, so we're good. Let's continue now. Reading number five. If you are honest, Joseph continues to the brothers, 
if you were honest, uh, your, your one brother, so he says like this, instead of nine of you remaining in prison here and one of you going to fetch Benjamin and come back, let's do it the other way around. One of you will remain here and the other nine of you can go home, but bring back Benjamin. He says, if you're honest, so then your one brother, I trust you, your one brother, at least for this, your one brother will be confined in your prison. And you, the rest of you, the other nine, go bring the grain for the hunger of your households. So he says to them, look, you say you're here for food. You're not spies. Here's what we're going to do. I'm going to give you the food that you want, that you came here to allegedly buy. You need food to feed your families in Canaan? Sure. All right, I'm giving you the food. And I'll let nine of you go, but one of them, one of you, I'm going to keep. Collateral. And bring your youngest brother to me. Come back with Benjamin so that your words may be verified and you will not die. And they did so. And they said one to another, indeed, we are guilty for our brother that we witness the distress of his soul. In other words, the reason why, why all this is happening to us is because of what happened with Joseph. We're guilty for our brother that we witness, listen to this, that we witness the distress of his soul when he begged us. You know what that means? We didn't have that in the story, the details, when we encountered it originally. Joseph begged for his life. You think he was stoic and just like didn't say anything? He was begging them not to hurt him. He was begging them not to throw him into a, to a pit. He was begging them not to sell him. So one said to the other, one brother said to the other brother, we're guilty. We heard his, we witnessed his distress and we did not listen. That is why this trouble has come upon us. This is now payback. Karma, divine payback for the trouble, for the, for the pain that we inflicted on our brother. That's why this trouble is befalling us. And Reuben answered them and he said, didn't I tell you saying, do not sin against the lad, but you didn't listen. Behold, his blood too is being demanded. Reuben says, I told you so. I told you not to sin against the lad. Did you listen? No. And now his blood is now being accounted for. Now is being demanded. Now it's payback time. Now we're in trouble. It's payback time. So what's Reuben saying? Is he just like rubbing it in? He's saying, I told you so. You should have listened to me. I mean, that's like, you know, armchair quarterback, uh, hindsight 2020. He's saying something more. He's saying, and, and I'm sure I explained this last year as well when we did this. Um, the brothers were feeling like they are getting punished now, 20 years later, because of what they did to their brother. That's why all this trouble has come upon us. And Reuben says, is it only wrong because you're feeling the consequences? Right. Why, why, are you, why are you feeling regret over Joseph? Ah, we should have listened to him. We should have taken mercy upon him. We shouldn't have just sold. Why do you feel that? Oh, because you're having some complications in your life right now. And you're saying that's happening. Because, in other words, what do, you, what do you really regret? You regret the wrong that you did? Or do you regret the fact that that's coming out to bite you, you know, 20 years later? You're only feeling sorry about Joseph because you're feeling sorry for yourselves. Are you with me on this? So he says to his brothers, you don't really regret selling Joseph. You really are upset that some, some hardship is befalling you now and you're attributing it to that. So you feel bad about that, but you don't feel bad about that in and of itself. You feel bad the fact that it's now coming back to hurt you. All right, wonderful. That's not true tshuva. True, true teshuva is not that you regret the punishment or you, you regret it insofar as there's punishment or consequences. No, true tshuva is I know that it's wrong. Not because it's like you ever hear uh, like people, like public officials apologize. I'm sorry. You know, it, it, the apology is only when there are repercussions, right? It's only when now like you're being thrown out of office. Now it's like, oh, I'm so sorry if they got hurt. I didn't mean to. And it's like, are you sorry? Or are you, are you sorry for them? Or are you sorry for yourself that you're now being thrown out, right? What, what are you sorry for? Again, it's not, 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 not anyone specifically in mind. But again, what are, you, what are you actually sorry about? Are you sorry? Are you, do you genuinely feel empathy with that person that you, that you hurt? Or are you empathizing with yourself and feeling bad about the consequences and now saying something to try to alleviate the consequences? So Reuben says to them, 
I told you 20 years ago, don't sin against the land. Not because now, 20 years later, there's some repercussions, but because that's, that the act was wrong. I told you not to hurt him. I told you to throw him into a pit, and I meant to rescue him from the pit. And you sold him as a slave. You didn't listen. His blood's being demanded now. But that's not what makes it wrong. What makes it wrong is the act itself. Again, you know, we had an um, uh, interesting uh, theoretical question that came up at a Kabbalah and Coffee class a, a few months ago. It was, if you could do something wrong that, that, wouldn't, that wouldn't hurt anyone, or if you would, it's kind of like, oh, I think, I think the example was if you could steal from a company but it wouldn't, no one would ever find out and it wouldn't hurt the company, again, theoretically, right? Would that be okay? <laughs> and it's kind of like, well, it depends on how you define okay, right? Like if, if okay or not okay is only defined by the consequences, well, then yeah, you're okay. But if okay or not okay is defined by your, where you are like and what you're doing, irrespective of consequences, then it's not okay. Right, like it, it doesn't matter if anybody will find out, or if I'll get caught, or if I'll get busted, or if I'll get in trouble. It's wrong. It's if it's wrong, it's wrong. So, two different perspectives, right? Philosophically, you could say that you know morality and ethics is is all about consequent consequences. It's a consequentialist moral reasoning, or you could say it's you know an absolute, absolutist, absolute moral reason. Are morals and values absolute, or are they contingent on consequences? Well. The brothers were saying it's it was wrong then because of the consequences now. And Ruben says, no, it's wrong because it's wrong. There happened to be consequences coming back to you 20 years later, but it was wrong then also. So Ruben is kind of recalibrating or, or kind of resetting a Jewish perspective on right, wrong, morals, ethics, values, you know, kosher, not kosher. Yeah, Donna. It's very interesting getting into the, the Jewish perspective on finance. Uh, like I'm thinking like when the course with Rabbi Schusterman and like a shoe store and someone, a, a potential customer goes in and has no intention of buying, you know, but just tries out all the shoes. So that's in one sense, a, some sort of theft. Right. You know? it's, it's, it's deception, theft of uh, expectation. I thought I was going to make a sale. You never had intention to make to, to purchase. So there's an imbalance in information here. Exactly. Exactly. So what makes it wrong? You could say, you know, I didn't hurt anybody and didn't steal anything. And, you know, I mean, that could also be argued, you know, you took someone's time and energy and you, maybe you took them away from someone else who could have been an actual buyer. Maybe somebody was browsing the store and didn't end up getting served because you were monopolizing the, the the worker whatever it is anyway so you could but you could also argue that maybe maybe no one got hurt but is it right right as you're saying it may not be right again i'm not going to weigh in on specifics it's more of a nuanced conversation but there there's a there's a difference between what's wrong because there are consequences it, versus what's wrong just because it's wrong and that's something that we learn as we mature you know when we're younger maybe it's like it's all about reward and punishment. So if there's no punishment, then that means it's okay. And at some point we hopefully grow to realize even if there's no punishment, things can still not be okay. It still might not be okay, right? Even without punishment. Okay, let's jump back in. Now, this was the dialogue happening between the brothers. They're being put through, they were put in prison for three days. They're told that you can go home, but you have to bring back Benjamin. We're keeping one of your brothers indefinitely in, 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 in prison in a dungeon here in Egypt. Now they're like, they're talking in Hebrew amongst themselves saying, told you so, told you. We were wrong 20 years ago. So verse 23, they did not know that Joseph understood for the interpreter was between them. There had been an interpreter this whole time. They had no idea that Joseph understood them. Of course, that was his, Mamalashin, that was his uh, mother tongue, Hebrew. And he turned away from them and wept. So he went to a private room and he cried, hearing his brothers talk about regretting what they did and Reuben saying, I told you so. Hearing that dialogue got him choked up. He went and cried. 
he got himself together and then he returned to them and spoke to them. And he took Shimon, Simeon from among them and prisoned him before his eyes. Uh, he prisoned him before their eyes. Shimon was one of the warrior brothers who destroyed Shem. It was Shimon and Levi. Shimon and Levi was the, the dynamic duo. So he decided best if I'm putting one in prison, let me take one of those two, Shimon, the older one. Let me put him away so that Levi doesn't have his partner in, uh, in combat. And Joseph commanded, see how long we have left. Um, we're going to go a little bit further today and then we're going to stop. Joseph commanded and Joseph commanded and they filled their vessels with grain. They meaning, I don't believe that that is referring to the brothers themselves. I think they means the, the officials, the, the, the workers there. He, he told them to fill the vessels of his brothers with grain, with the food. And he commanded to return their money into each one sack. So they basically came with bags. And he said to his people, load up the bags with food and also put back the money. Give them back their money. To give them provisions for the journey, say the Ladera provision for the journey, and he did so for them. And they loaded their grain upon their donkeys and they went away from there. So they loaded all the bags with the grain on their donkeys and the, ten, and the nine brothers now, Shimon left behind in a prison, nine brothers right off into the sunset. Well, they didn't know that in addition to the food, they got their money back. So the one opened the sack to give fodder to his donkey. He opened up the, the bag to pull out food at the lodging place. And he saw his money in there. He, he saw his money there it was in the mouth of a sack. He saw it right there. He saw the money. And he said to his brothers, my money has been returned. I, I gave money for the food. And I got the food and the money back. And indeed, here it is in my sack. Their hearts sank. That's all they need now. All, the, all they need now is to like be accused of stealing money from Egypt. That's all they need, right? They gave them money, and now they're traveling back home, and they have the bags of food, and their money is inside. And trembling, they turn to one another saying, what is this that God has done to us? What is going on here? I love that expression. What is God doing to us? They recognize that it's coming from God, but they can't wrap their head around what is going on here. What's crazy is that you and I have the perspective of like completely outsiders. Thousands of 3,500 years later, and we have the benefit of knowing how the story will play out and saying, yeah, of course you're going to get the money and then you're going to go there and you're going to go there. Like we know how it plays out. But in the moment, they can't even fathom what's the end of the story. What's going on here? And they came, so they, they went back home. They came to Jacob, their father, to the land of Canaan. And they told him all that had befallen them. They told him the whole story. Saying the man, the Lord of the land, that's Joseph, but they didn't know, spoke to us harshly and he accused us of spying on the land. And we said to him, no, we're honest. We were never spies. We would never do that. <laughs> of course, what would a spy actually say, right? Isn't that exactly what a spy would say? We are 12 brothers, the sons of our father. One is gone. And today the youngest is with our father in the land of Canaan. And the man, the Lord of the land, said to us, well, th with this, I will know that you're honest. Leave one of your brothers with me, Shimon. And what is needed for the hunger of your household is take and go and bring your youngest brother to me. He said, I will know that you are not spies, that you are honest. If you say that there's 12 sons, one is gone, but one's at home, bring me that one and I'll know that you're telling the truth. Then I will give you your brother, the one that's in prison, Shimon, and you may travel around the land, then you'll get full access. And it came to pass that they were emptying their sacks. And behold, each one's bundle of money was in a sack. When they traveled on the way, one person opened up his sack and found the money. And they were panicking. They all panicked when one person found their, their, the, the money that was returned. Now they're home. They tell their father the story. They start unpacking. And now everyone finds the money. They saw the bundles of their money. They and their father, everyone saw it. And they became frightened. And their father Jacob said to them, 
You have bereaved me. You guys are killing me. Joseph is gone. Shimon is gone. And you want to take Benjamin? You kidding me? He says to them, you're, 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 you're making me grieve and bereave and you're, you're causing me the worst type of anguish. Joseph is gone. I mean, he's almost accusing them of Joseph being gone, by the way. I mean, look, I'm not in, uh, I'm not in law enforcement, but I've listened to a true crime podcast or two, not going to lie. And I'll tell you, when there's a crime and a missing person, the first ones you go to, yeah, are the people who were seen last with that person. That's what you do. That's like step one of investigation is where were they last seen? Who was the last ones to have interaction with them? He knows, Jacob knows, the last time he saw Joseph was he sent him, he sent him to check on the brothers. Well, you think you think Jacob's a fool? Yeah, come on. Last thing, he knows about the interfamily uh, politics, if you will. He knows about the friction. He was there. The Torah tells us he was trying to, trying to downplay the, the, the dream because he didn't want the brothers to really get upset. He knew what was going on. And the last thing he knew, last time he saw Joseph, he was sending them, sending him to their direction. Can he, does he have facts on his side? No. Suspicion seems like. You have bereaved me. He doesn't say, I have been bereaved. You have bereaved me. You with me? That's an accusation. You have bereaved me. Not, I've lived such a difficult life. I lost, I lost uh, Joseph. I've now lost Shimon. I'm not going to lose Benjamin. No, 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 no. You have bereaved me. Joseph is gone. Shimon is gone. And you want to take Benjamin. All these troubles have come upon me. This is not the first time, not the last time that Jacob will lament his challenge, his difficulty in life. Jacob lived a very difficult life. And Reuben spoke to his father. Reuben, the oldest, the firstborn, the one who tried to uh, rescue Joseph by throwing him into a pit and pick him up later. Reuben stands up and says to his father, you may put my two sons to death. If I do not bring him, Benjamin, back to you, put him in my hands and I will return him to you. You can trust me. Give me Benjamin. I'll take him down. We'll all come back. And if not, you can kill my sons. Jacob's not impressed. But Jacob said, my son shall not go down with you. Not happening. Benjamin's not going down with you because his brother from his mother, Joseph, is dead. And he alone is left. All that's left from Rachel, my beloved Rachel, the only one that's left is Benjamin. And if misfortune befalls him on the way you are going, you will bring down my gray hair and sorrow to the grave. If anything, if I send Benjamin to you and anything would happen to him, I would be finished. My life is over. I'm not going to take that risk. I cannot do that. Benjamin is not going. You understand the implications. We'll stop here. I understand the implications of Benjamin not going is that they can't show up to, to Egypt again because the stipulation was go home, bring back Benjamin. And until then, we're keeping Shimon in, in a prison here. So no Benjamin, no Egypt, no Shimon, no food garnished. They now have a brother that's languishing in Egypt by himself. Well, Joseph's there also, but whatever. They didn't know that. But Shimon is languishing there. They can't go back without Benjamin. The, 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 the deal was clear. They now stole money somehow. They didn't even know how they stole money, but they got their money back from Egypt. And now that's the last thing you want is financial impropriety in the eyes of Joseph, in the eyes of the viceroy who's accused them of being spies in the first place. Their lives are falling apart. What's crazy about this is that as their lives literally are falling apart and Jacob's life, as they feel like their lives are falling apart, nothing bad is happening to them in reality. Like everything is in control. It's Joseph, there's a plan, Shimon is fine, everyone's gonna be fine, no one's in actual danger, like everyone's okay. But they have no idea. And I just wanna mention that because in life, this is our story. We don't see the plan, 
We don't know why. We begin to panic. We start flailing in the water. We forget all of the training that we have, how to float, how to survive. We forget all and thrive. We forget all of that. We panic at the first, at first, at the signs of challenge. Sometimes we panic, we lose our bearings, and we 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 say it's terrible, it's 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 futile, I can't do it, it's it's horrible. We have these narratives. The Torah reminds us with the story. Take a deep breath. Take it easy. Right? There's a story. God's in control. In this case, God and Joseph, they were in control. And um, please, God, all will be good. Is it always good? I can't say that. But is God always in control? I can say that, yeah. And if God's in control... At least they know it's meant to be, at the very least. And if that could be a, um, if that can create some comfort, that's then, then it's not a bad thing. All right, my friends, that's it for reading for for today. We're in the middle of reading number five. Yeah, the story is rich. There's no another way to put it. The story is jam packed. We'll begin chapter forty three tomorrow. Um. Did I when I was reading the last few verses, was the screen shared or was it not shared? Yes. It was yes. shared. Okay, I can't I, I'm like I, I stopped sharing at some point. I don't remember when I stopped. Okay. All right, good. So what's the moral of the story? I, I mean, I'm gonna I'm gonna just double down quickly on, on what I just said. To me, the takeaway, what I'm gonna live with right now for the you know, till we meet next tomorrow is this idea of when I don't know the plan, it doesn't mean that there's no plan. My lack of knowing the plan does not mean that there is no plan. Just because I don't know it doesn't actually mean that things are out of control. It just means that I'm not privy to the information yet. If I can be a little bit more okay in that space between what I know and what I don't know and the gap between, you know, in, in that space of unknowing, if I can be more okay, it's good. It's it's a good thing. It's good for me. It's good for God. It's good for the plan. It's good for the blessings. It's good. It means I have faith. I have trust, positivity. I have humility knowing that, you know, I don't know everything. A lot, a lot, a lot of good things come from that space. So again, the mantra for today is, at least what I'm taking from this personally is, just because I don't know the plan, doesn't mean that there is no plan. Let's say that in the positive. There is a plan, whether I'm aware of it or not. All right, that's it for today. Questions, comments? Whether we're aware of it yet. Yes, and sometimes, <laughs> and sometimes, it's not, it's not gonna happen, never gonna happen. Sometimes, yeah. I'll try to be brief. It, it makes me think of the part of the anti-Semitism class where the French president came over and there were all the demonstrations but the Rebbe said that there were plans there were secret negotiations but the problem is is we don't know How, when do we know to sit back and do nothing right and right. when do we know to stand up and say something it's right. hard very hard so that's the the one thing about that class is that we don't have clear cut you know Boom. It's like clear when you do this, when you do that. You just have to, hopefully you get some guidance. Hopefully, you know, it's good to have a Rebbe. It's really good to have someone that says, by the way, I didn't mention it in the course because I didn't want it to go to spin out of control because I thought it might, if I, if I mentioned this, but I'll do it now because, you know, we're, we're in a safe space amongst friends. The Rebbe was also against the protests against the Soviet Union. I don't know if you know this. When, when world Jewry was, was protesting communism and the, the Soviets, free Soviet Jewry, the Rebbe was saying, I'm from there and I know how they think. And this is not going to work. You're not going to intimidate them with protests. It's not, that, that's not going to work. And indeed, at, listen, it's, the, the Rebbe, there was a lot, there were a lot of people that pushed back on, on that, that disagreed vehemently. Like Sharansky, I heard from Sharansky himself. Like they refused like Sharansky. He was at a the JLI conference retreat two years um 
not this last one in Stone Mountain, a few years ago in, in Virginia. He was there. I was at a, at a session that he did. And he said, you know, he doesn't necessarily, didn't necessarily agree with the Rebbe then and now, because he was a guy that was fighting the Soviets. The Rebbe had a different approach. Rebbe said, quiet diplomacy, back go channels, whatever. But not always, you know, sometimes you got to go, so you got to go strong. And I don't mean to derail this class, uh, you know, today's session either. Okay, I have one more comment. I have, yeah. I have to add to that. Yes. Which was always very difficult for me. I grew up in Montgomery, Alabama during the civil rights movement. Mm. And the rabbis came down and marched. And the people that lived there were very unhappy about that. You don't live here. You don't know what we're living in. And it was very difficult. Like, I was not happy with my parents mm. to say that. Interesting. But these are the conflicts that we live with every day. Yeah, that's complicated. That is complicated because you would think that showing solidarity is good, but sometimes it can be right. not wanted. Yeah, it can rub some people. This is where we got to do our best, use our best judgment, and then have siyata deshmaya, have belief that God will help and guide our choices. Kind of surrender and say, God, you know, either show me a sign or help guide my choice. Or if I'm, if I make a choice and get it wrong, you know, let me know sooner than later that I need to, you know, um, adjust, adjust. Uh, you know, I always love the, the, the uh, navigation. I use Waze, this really company. <laughs> anyway, it's like, you know, when you make a wrong turn or you miss an exit, doesn't get upset. She always stays calm. She says, I mean, I have a, whatever the default voice is. And she says, um, you know, recalculating route, no big deal. And then just, you know, just pull off this exit and just turn around. Like, no, like, no judgment, just, just stays very calm. We have to do that for ourselves also. Can't beat ourselves up for making wrong choices, making wrong turns. Stay the course, even keel, readjust, recalibrate um, when necessary and keep on moving forward. That's the plan. Right. All right. Great to see you guys. Joy, Donna, Sarah, Olia. Don't forget tonight. No Torah studies. It's unusual. No Wednesday night tonight. Thursday night Hanukkah edition Torah studies. 7.30 p.m. on Zoom only, not in person. If you are not able to make that class, and you usually do make that class, no worries. We'll post audio and video um, shortly after the class so you can catch it still and enjoy it. All right. Great to see you. Enjoy Hanukkah, day number three. Take care, everybody. Mm -hmm. Bye, guys.